Um, I do want to kick off with our second workshop, which was public health in the time of COVID. Um, so Sarah Simmons and uh, Sherelle Arnold and um, Nirali Bora, and I'm not sure if anyone else is from- and Teresa Branson. And Teresa Branson is there, yay. Mm -hmm. So um, why don't you guys kick off, and again, let's try to do the same 10 minutes with five minutes of questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, Hi, my name is Sarah Simmons. I'm the Environmental Health Director here at the Kent County Health Department. I've been in my role for quite a while, and I'm here alongside um, Dr. Nurali Bora, our Medical Director, and Teresa Branson, our Deputy Health Administrator. Um, and I just wanted to start by sort of handing it over to Teresa and Nurali to start the conversation, because we had intended this to be more of a dialogue with the, with the workshop group. So I'm going to start by showing you the data from Kent County um, I'm going to share my screen and then Teresa and Norelli, if you wouldn't mind just speaking to the data. Can you see it? Yeah, I don't know if you can make it a little bit bigger if that's good for everyone. But. Um, I'm going to try. I don't, actually, I don't know how to make it bigger. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's okay. okay. I mean, because with the, with the time that we have, um, and thank it, thanks everyone. Um, and we can make this um, link to the dashboard available. Um, as of right now, we have our total cases are t a little over 20,000 cases. Um, our new cases are 693. Um, we are averaging about 500 cases daily and um, about, I'm sorry, 500 cases daily, about four deaths a day. And um, currently um, we're averaging about 693 um, Actually, our data today is 693 new cases, but 500 um, cases is what we're seeing daily. Our positivity rate is at about 13%. And when we look at COVID disparities, um, which is one area we want to do focus on today, overall, um, the Caucasian um, is rates are around, um, make up about 52% of the cases. African American makes up about 10% of the cases. Asian American is about 2.7% of the cases. And then there's other race. And when we look at Hispanic um, populations for ethnicity, that population makes up about 19%. One of the things that we're seeing, and there's like seven pages of data that we could you know, easily spend hours you know, digging into, is that early on in our COVID response, we were seeing greater disparities amongst our uh, Latinx populations and African Americans. And Norelli can correct me if I'm wrong, but we are within our Hispanic population, we are seeing um, individuals impacted about four and a half times more than uh, our Caucasian populations. And with African American, it was about two and a half to three times the rate as our white populations. Um, we're starting to see those um, populations of race ethnicity come down. And right about now, they're about maybe about, they make up about in total, maybe about 10% of, um, of the overall, you know, what the population is of Kent County. So African-Americans may account for 10% of the COVID cases, but they also account for about 10% of our population. So just to kind of preface, you know, our, our conversation for today and to let, provide some time for Nurali and Sarah as well, is we hit our first case in Kent County around March 12th. At that time, we were seeing really gross inequities and disparities on the southeast side of the state here in Michigan. Um, but we knew it wasn't a matter of if, it was going to be a matter of when. When are we going to start seeing these numbers hit higher in our community? And certainly where we are right now, just to kind of put some things in perspective. Um, we added more cases on Tuesday this week than we did during the entire month of June. We also had more cases in the first 12 days of November than what we had in all of October. And October was our, our highest month so far. So um, in terms of our response with COVID and public health overall and um, disparities, we um, at the health department, we have an incident command structure that Sarah and Norelli and I are all a part of with other colleagues here in public health. And we um, formed a race equity and inclusion team to be able to tackle some of these disparities. And we also have multiple other areas in our response, but we did that very early on to engage multiple populations because we wanted to 
um, make sure that we are targeting high incident areas in Kent County and also that disproportionality between different populations. So our work to date has been very strategic about addressing racial ethnic disparities in COVID, testing, surveillance, um, addressing vulnerable populations, which is an area that our populations made to be vulnerable, that um, Sarah has worked very hard in. Um, we've did a lot of communication, outreach, and engagement. Um, with our race equity and inclusion work, we've worked with at least 10 to 15 different population groups, really asking, taking time to listen to community, to understand what those concerns were, questions, how do they want to receive information, what do we need to do, and then coming back, adapting that information and bringing it back to the community. I think that's been one of the biggest things we've been able to do to kind of drive some of those numbers down and what we continue to do. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah Norelli to talk about some of the other specific um, strategies we've done to target some disparities in our overall response. So thank you, Teresa, that was a great recap. And um, I'm not gonna talk too long because I know Dr. Moore has a lot to say, but um, one of the things that we really took on um, in the beginning was um, persons experiencing homelessness. And that was a, a big endeavor by the, by the health department and as well as other community partners to make sure that that, that population had a safe place to go during um, when they were um, exposed to COVID-19, contracted the virus and had a safe place to, uh, and, a, and a healthy place really to re recuperate. Um, and we did that initially in the um, beginning of the response and we were able to uh, support 176 people as they recuperated from um, from COVID-19 during that process. And that was such an amazing learning experience and there were so many valuable takeaways and I could probably talk to you for hours about that. But um, it really just gave us a different perspective on areas of, of growth for, for um, not only public health, but for me, environmental health in terms of how are our institutions built? How are they how, is, how are things ventilated? How are the people that are really in very vulnerable situations being best served? So um, to Teresa's point, it really um, opened our eyes to a lot of different things. And I think that that was really valuable. Um, and Dr. Bora, I, I feel like we really need to hone in on the, the success that you've had with um, working with the migrant farms and, um, and the uh, long-term care. Sure. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you, Sarah. Um, and honestly, it's been a team effort. I mean, this has been a huge group of people working together to make all of this happen. And the community, um, our teams, people working just to make sure that we can do the best we can. And often we feel like there's, there's never enough that we can really be doing. A couple of things that I just wanted to mention. So one is the agricultural workers. So we knew that this was a very vulnerable population to begin with because this group travels throughout the U.S. They live in very close quarters. Um, they, it's a very hierarchical system. They often probably don't feel very safe to speak up about the safety of their environments. Um, they're on temporary visas or they may be undocumented. And so we recognized pretty early that we needed to do something and what that something was was challenging. And um, it was interesting. We had a lot of conversations with um, business owners and farm owners who have very different perspectives and um, different motivations. And so we were very lucky that the state um, also recognized the priority of this population in finding a space to create you know, for isolation for those who test positive. Um, and we were very fortunate that they were able to provide funding for testing. And so we had a team that helped with the contact tracing once the testing was done. And we had a group that was bilingual working for contact tracing to make sure that we could get them the information that they needed. And there was another group um, through um, the Michigan Health Department that would also provide them with guidance on, these are your legal rights. You can actually, if you test positive, there's money that you have access to to help offset the wages that you'll be losing. Um, so all of those things were really helpful and important because there's a lot of fear. Um, in testing positive, fear of losing wages that are, this is a vital, vital income for these people and their families. So um, we actually found that the rates were lower than we had anticipated, um, but there were, I, can't, I don't have the numbers offhand, but there were quite a few people who were tested and received care. So we were grateful for that. Um, I just wanna mention earlier in the pandemic, when we saw the significant disparities with our Latinx population, we saw that the cases were happening in those who were essential workers and where people were working in environments where they didn't have either the com probably you know either the language resources or you know when you have fear of losing your job it's not always easy to speak up for your safety and so we saw people working in factories close together where they couldn't speak up because they didn't have safe environments they were commuting to work 
um, with many other people. They were taking vans to work. And this is where we saw a lot of outbreaks happen early on, up to 200 in some of these factories. Um, we also saw cases in multi-generational households. So there might be one generation, you know, one person going to work, coming home, living with multiple, multiple family members who all would then become positive for COVID. And so that was heartbreaking to see. That we have seen decrease as factories and companies learn how to create safer environments. Um, but still, I mean, often, especially we've seen our long-term care facilities where it's, you know, PPE um, might be scarce, but people still have to work. These are some of our most hardworking, underpaid people in our community who care for our elderly and care for our grandparents. Um, and they are working in very challenging environments right now. There's significant staffing shortages. And so how do we all work together to protect these people in our community who are the most, most vulnerable to having serious effects from COVID. So those are some of the things that we're working with right now. And then I don't wanna to talk too much really, but just one other group that, you know, I think one of the silver linings of COVID has been some of the new relationships that we've been able to forge with our community. And one of them is, so we, we really wanted to work with our refugee communities because they were some of the essential workers early on that we did not have a good connection to. The Latinx community, we had a great group of leaders we could connect with. But with some of the refugee communities, we hadn't identified who the leaders were that we needed to work with. And so we were having just challenges, figuring out who do we talk to? How do we translate this in languages that are, you know, are difficult to find interpretation for? And so throughout this, we've, you know, we've learned um, about more groups out there. We've met many new community leaders and we forged new relationships that we really hope are going to help us communicate um, and have this bi-directional communication and give and take as we go forward. Marilee, if I can um, build on that, and I don't know where we're at with our, our time with our 10 minutes here, but building relationships has been absolutely essential. So in addition to the refugee communities, um, and right from the start, we were having a lot of community briefing calls with the African-American community, multiple uh, refugee communities. Um, we assigned a liaison to um, um, the Hispanic um, community. Um, we also have been doing outreach and having ongoing calls with the Native American um, community leaders. Um, but part of our race equity inclusion section of our um, COVID response, also because it's about inclusion, we've also been doing a lot of work with uh, persons with disabilities, um, working with disability advocates, um, Association for Blind and Visually Impaired, Deaf and Hard of Hearing. And we have learned so much in, in these community outreach and these calls that, have, um, that we may not have thought about otherwise. Um, and I think that's just been the power of when you authentically engage um, community in this type of response um, in every day in public health and other agencies, that's really where um, I think the true uh, work and, and ideas on what's needed gets done. And part of that relationship building will also help us um, to continue to build um, trust. So even though we've partnered with many communities in the past, we're partnering in a different way now. And during a time when people are scared and during a time when um, COVID is hitting close to home. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to our faith-based institutions, since March, we've been meeting with uh, area pastors on a weekly basis. It's just another group of people that have a lot of influence in the community and can reach a lot of um, people in the community and within their um, organizations. Um, so I think as we look at look ahead and as we approach and prepare um, and become ready for a vaccine becoming available in our community because we have a very strong team working on mass uh, vaccination um, plans, we have to be um, engaged in more authentic community conversations to overcome some of the real concerns that some are historical um, in terms of injustices that have taken place um, throughout history um, where people do have distrust in some of the very systems that are going to be making this vaccine available. Um, and so we're going to be working very hard and have a very um, uh, tough road ahead because we're working on a hard and fast time frame to have to start engaging in these conversations. We're going to be doing one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews with community leaders. Those are starting um, next week. We're going to be holding community forums and stakeholder forums. All of this designed to engage in um, community and inform um, our vaccine distribution plan so that um, we can have something that's not only available, but it is acceptable and it is also um, mobilizing individuals and leaders in the community and residents um, with the information that they need to make a choice. 
Teresa, if I could, and that was an awesome summary. <laughs> if I could yeah. just respond to um, one of the questions in our, um, our chat box, and this is a fascinating question because this was such a learning curve for for us at KCHD, and it's from SS Spittler. Um, KCHD, how is our our community meeting the needs of dual multi-diagnosis individuals, homeless, severe mental health, and COVID positive? I will tell you firsthand that was our biggest challenge. Um, the it was not a matter of whether they were experiencing homelessness or whether or not they were COVID positive. It was that they had um, multi-diagnoses of chronic disease as well as um, mental illness. And that was probably one of the things that we least, I would say for, my, for me in my mind, was the least anticipated. And I'm grateful I had the experience to learn from it because it was a great way to really feel the complexity of persons experiencing homelessness. But um, that was when we really had to engage with our community partners um, like Pine Rest and um, some, and you know, our, our housing, our, excuse me, our um, service providers downtown like Mel Trotter who have those people on staff that can help us navigate that the mental health complexities. And in, if there were people that had chronic disease and could not um, complete all of their um, um, ADLs, their basic daily living, we, we did not actually serve them because it was so complex that they actually needed greater care than we could provide at our sites. So I just want to say thank you for that question. That is a, I think that that's a long-term question. I don't think that that's something that we have definitely solved for. I think that mental health should be integrated in more of what we do as a, at a systems level. Um, but I'm just really grateful that that question was asked. There's still a challenge in our um, adult foster care system right now when they have um, adults with developmental disabilities, adults with behavioral health issues who are testing positive and are really are not able to follow the guidelines for isolation or for quarantine. It's, a, it's an issue that we probably get a phone call every other day about how do we manage. And it's a, it's a society question that we need to come up with a solution with and we're trying and I don't feel like we have one at this point, but it's needed. So we could talk about this for a really, really long time. <laughs> so if, um, I don't, I don't want to, um, you know, take too much time. I don't know where we're at on time. So um, I just want to be respectful of that. Thank you so, so much, all of you. It's incredible that we got all three of you here tonight. And um, I, again, I apologize for the workshop oh, breakout room not working. Um, because I feel like there is so much to discuss in all of these um, uh, issues and, and topics. Um, but thank you. I really appreciate the updated information.